It's indeed ironic that the fictional heroes of Orson Welles' 1938 radio play, The War of the Worlds, were humble bacteria, and that in barely 80 years, real life villains, superbugs, would threaten the very existence of our planet. We're in a perpetual war, a war without and a war within. It's us versus them our brains versus their genes, and their genes are programmed to win. They say that if you leave bacteria unchecked, they double every 20 minutes. That means in one day there's enough to cover the face of the Earth. By 48 hours, a mass four times the size of our planet. We simply cannot win the war without by making better antibiotics or better vaccines. But perhaps the biggest enemy in this war is ourselves, the war within. Our collective intellect versus our fearful hearts. We're afraid, and our fear leads us to treat. How many times does a mother bring her child into the emergency room and really demand that they be put on an antibiotic, even though the mother and the doctor know it's unlikely to be make any difference because it's a virus? How many times do we go to our primary care physician and demand the same when we have a cough or bronchitis? It's a dangerous game we're playing. Bill Gates, in his sobering TED talk just this year, was speaking to viral pandemics stimulated by the Ebola crisis, H1N1 and other avian flu. He said, we're woefully unprepared, unprepared for the next outbreak. We don't have the tools. We don't have the infrastructure. We're simply not ready to deal with it. In a small hemorrhagic RNA virus in West Africa, because of global transportation, can quickly take over the planet. Marin McKenna, noted journalist and author, in her even more sobering TED Talk, announced to the world that we've basically entered into the post-antibiotic era. Most of our best antibiotics don't work anymore. Ironically, Alexander Fleming, the inventor of penicillin, or the scientist who discovered penicillin, warned against the moral ha hazard of indiscriminate antibiotic use at the time of the invention. He said, the, in the uh, user of antibiotics who does it indiscriminately is morally responsible for the death of the patient who succumbs to the antibiotic-resistant organism. I hope this evil can be avoided. So in the developed world, we overtreat. And as a result, we have a similar problem with rapid spread of, of antibiotic-resistant organisms all over the globe. So here we sit at the early part of the 21st century. Many people don't remember that for most of recorded history before the 20th century and the introduction of antibiotics, most people died of infection. In the United States, the average life expectancy was 57 years. Today, people die of heart disease and cancer and stroke and trauma. But that's only part of the story, because actually many of those people actually succumb to an infection. And as antibiotic resistance continues, and expands exponentially, most of them will die of infection. All of us will likely die of infection if something doesn't change. It's such a crisis that an executive order was placed by the president, a task force convened of experts and stakeholders, and they recommended a plan of action. Over the next five years, we'll have better antibiotics, we'll have better vaccines, we'll have better diagnostics. I'm not certain, as a physician and a surgeon, that we have five years. The challenge we face, whether we're dealing with a viral pandemic or antibiotic resistance, is that the spread and the growth is exponential. Exponential means that the rate increases with every new case. But fortunately, we've entered the dawn of the 21st century, and we live in a biointelligence era. The problem is not one of science. The problem is a motivation. In the 21st century, 
biointelligent innovation will occur at the interfaces from the traditional information sciences, physical sciences, and life sciences. But we have a conundrum in innovation. I'll take two examples. The conundrum is this. We can either innovate by pushing technology in, or we can pull technology in. What do I mean by that? Take surgical robotics as an example. Marvelous technology. The first surgical robotic procedures report performed in the United States in approximately the year 2000. The robot has had some innovation along the margin, but basically it's the same technology that we had in 2000. The problem was the focus was on the technology. The problem was that the, it was driven by the market. Compare that with the Internet of Things, with your iPhone, and the impact that's having on chronic disease management and health in this very day. The iPhone is solutions focused, and it's driven by usability. And because of that, innovation occurs continuously, as we all know, since we need to upgrade it about every six months to stay on top of the technology. Well, as I mentioned, we're fearful, and fear motivates us, and fear causes us to make decisions that in retrospect we might regret. What do you do when you're afraid of the dark? What do you hope for? You hope that someone will turn on the light. Light reveals things about our world, about our physical world. Sometimes it reveals things we don't want to see, but at least we know what's going on. It turns out that if you take a single wavelength of light, it reveals things too. And you can shine that on a microbe and focus it in on them. And the things it reveals are simply spectacular. Things about the structure and the function of the cell wall of the organism, the actual biology as it occurs in real time. And the technology to do it exists. It's about the size of a refrigerator and probably weighs a little bit more. It requires very sophisticated people to operate. If you bump into it, you have to have a technician come in and line it up again. And at the end of the day, it may take an hour or more to gain enough information. But what it reveals is spectacular. Digital signatures that are specific to the strain of virus or the strain of antibiotic resistant bacteria, analogous to the fingerprint used by the FDI. And these signatures can be matched against a similar library to give us information about antibiotic resistance and viral pandemics in real time. But we can't give our health workers in the underdeveloped world refrigerators to carry around with them. What would it look like, a solution that we could carry with us? Well, it would be portable. It would be something that you could perhaps hold in the palm of your hand. It would be non-invasive. It wouldn't require that you draw blood. It would be highly accurate down to the strain. There wouldn't be any reagents. You wouldn't need a sophisticated technologist to run it and expensive equipment. It would give you the results immediately, because until we can give people the results immediately at the point of care, behavior will not change. It'd be easy to use. As I mentioned, it wouldn't require a sophisticated technologist. And oh, by the way, you might want to put in wireless capability so it could upload data automatically to cloud-based infrastructures for real-time epidemiology all around the world. Well, if you want to take a solutions focus, a usability focus, and create a device that could empower people to change the world when it comes to antibiotic resistance or pandemics, you'd turn to my friend, my colleague, and my partner, Dr. Greg Auner. Greg is one of the leading innovators in the world in smart sensors and microsystems. What's that? It's taking that refrigerator and putting it in the palm of your hand. He's also one of the leaders in Raman spectroscopy, which was that di digital signature that I gave you. So we started this with Orson Welles and his radio play, and that was pretty uncomfortable. So I'm going to finish it with Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill galvanized the world against a Nazi oppression at the start of, the, of World War II with a similar radio play in 
February of 1941. And I'll paraphrase a little bit. Put your confidence in us. Give us your faith and your blessing, and with providence, all will be well. We will not fear or falter. We will not weaken or tire. Give us the tools, and we will finish the job. Thank you.